Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Sheena Peril and I'm an author and knitwear designer and I've been doing various types of historical costuming since about 2012, uh, steampunk since about 2011, and cosplay since I don't know how long. <laughs> Probably since around 2000-ish. Do you struggle with textures and restrictive clothing? Do socks require a procedure or a trick for you to wear them comfortably? Do you struggle with large groups? Is the summer heat a problem? This is a video for people who are curious about costuming, who want to get involved in the community, but have questions or concerns about challenges that make them feel like they might be unwelcome. You might be nervous about the level of detail a certain group requires, or you might have a visible medical condition, such as the need for a mobility aid or service animal, or some kind of physical medical device an energy li limiting condition or severe allergies or sensitivities. I've dealt with most of these issues to one degree or another over the past several years and I've also been a part of several different types of communities so I thought I would share my experience with you. For this video I'm going to concentrate specifically on historical costuming because it tends to come with more rules than things like steampunk or cosplay. Specifically, I'm going to talk about living history, historical reenacting, and the SCA or the Society of Creative Anachronism. So let's start with a quick breakdown about the different types of groups. But just as a disclaimer, this is based on my own personal experience with the groups that I have been with. So your mileage may vary depending on your location and what groups are closest to you. You might not mesh with the first group that you try, but that hardly makes them the end all be all of historical costuming. And I'm in no way trying to say that one group is better than another, just that certain groups might meet different needs in different ways. So I got my start by volunteering at a local history museum that had a historical village. I was a living history interpreter for almost seven years, both first and third person. And this means that I spoke both about what people did in the past to vi visitors of the museum, but I also had a character that I played or a persona. This is sometimes called an impression or a variety of other things, depending on the group. At the museum, I did 1860s, 1890s, and World War I. When I started volunteering, I was fine, but through my time there, I had chronic bronchitis and then developed several of the chronic conditions that I still struggle with today. As a result, my experience varied a lot during my time there. The main thing that helped me was making sure that I spoke to whoever was in charge of the volunteers or the village that day, communicating my needs in terms of breaks or if I needed to be in an air-conditioned building if it was very hot, and making sure that I had everything I needed with me for my comfort and my health. This was a fairly casual position, but just how relaxed it could be varied depending on who was in charge and what the event was. They were starting to get a little bit more strict when I left, and there were different rules for paid employee interpreters and us volunteers. In general, anything modern had to be hidden or out of sight. This could mean covering uh, uh, monitoring de devices with collars, partlets, long sleeves, or other parts of your costumes, uh, removing nail polish, and non-period appropriate jewelry like modern watches, stud earrings, facial piercings whenever possible, tattoos, dyed hair, uh, etc. Some costume pieces were provided by the museum, but it was kind of a crapshoot in terms of what would fit you and what coordinated. <laughs> so if you wanted something in your size and in your style, eventually if all the volunteers would start making their own costumes if they were going to be there regularly. Now this is a totally different case for the people who just showed up for our holiday events or like the one-off events, but the people who came in on a weekly or monthly basis usually had their own costumes or at least partial costumes. Now, none of us walked in with a full wardrobe right off the bat, so you might start off all in museum kit, and then the next time you'd have your own skirt and then your own shoes, and then you would just be using a, a couple of accessories from the wardrobe, like a shawl or a hat or something. And slowly over time, you would build up your kit. And it's the same thing with a lot of different reenactment and historical groups that you add to your wardrobe over time. 
I've been a member of the SCA for about a year now, so I haven't been to a ton of events, but I can say that I have a pretty good feel for the level of costume detail, which is extremely variable. It ranges from people in leggings and oversized t-shirts with belts approximating a tunic and hose for the medieval period, to extremely detailed hand embroidered gowns that were made using historical practices and expensive carefully sourced materials to everything in between. No one bats an eye if an 11th century peasant has green hair or if an ancient Egyptian is speeding around in a wheelchair. The main thing is the camaraderie and love of history and learning. And so the SCA, it's kind of a cross between living history and cosplay. It fits in that middle ground. The SCA goes up to the end of the Tudor period, around 1600, 1601, and covers all of the history up to that point. So you'll often see Vikings eating lunch with Hellenistic Greeks, a Chinese courtesan, a Spanish conquistador, a Spanish conquistador, and a samurai. All periods, cultures, and countries welcome. As long as you are trying and learning, that is all that matters. Garb is optional, but highly encouraged at most events, and some events even have loner garb available if it's your first time visiting. All of this depends on what kingdom, barony, principality, or other subgroup you fall into, and how that particular group is organized, and also just how big it is and what their resources are like. But in general, everyone is welcome regardless of experience or knowledge level. Even more casual than the SCA are social groups. You can usually find these on places like Facebook or meetup.com or other social media sites, and they're really just people who enjoy making costumes and hanging out together in them. The rules of the group can vary widely, but make sure that you check the requirements for the one that you're interested in. Don't be afraid to ask questions. These groups are usually era specific and could be as broad as the Victorian era, all the way down to a particular decade or specifying a class or role, like suffragettes of the 1890s. Usually they aren't that specific though. The last group that I want to talk about is historical reenactors. These are typically battlefield groups, so they concentrate on a specific conflict, like the American Revolution or the Civil War. They usually have the strictest requirements in terms of costumes, speech, appearance, etc. But in most cases, if you have some kind of disability or you still have your modern haircut or something, they aren't going to kick you to the curb or take away your hearing aid or say that you can't participate if you're showing up using a cane. Again, the rules are going to vary from group to group and situation to situation. If you're brand new, they're going to be more lenient than if you've been coming for six months. But make sure that you do your research first on the group because, like I said, they can vary widely. For the SCA social groups and historical reenactors, there's usually someone in the group assigned to talk to new people about what is expected. And as in the SCA, we call this person the chatelaine or sometimes the steward. And this person organizes meetups and helps new people get settled into the group and figure out if they need garb for their first event, um, what they can borrow, what types of behaviors are and aren't allowed, and if the site is going to be accessible for them. Um, they also help arrange additional accommodations if necessary. I haven't been part of a reenactment group myself, but I have interacted with them through my work at the museum. Reenactors are by far the most hardcore history nuts out of any of the groups that I've listed. Um, and I've rarely, if ever, seen one of them break character. They have a reputation for being nitpicky and occasionally taking things a little too far. This can be particularly true of Civil War groups. However, as I said before, every group is different. Most of the reactors I have spoken to are absolutely lovely people. And across the board, the historical costuming people I have met and worked with in the last 12 years have been the kindest, most caring, accepting, and open-minded people that I've worked with, regardless of the era that they portray. Also keep in mind that some reenactors intentionally play unlikable or problematic characters in order to teach about the less savory side of history. For example, Confederate soldiers, slave owners, plantation owners, that kind of thing. So know that who they are 
themselves can be very different from the character that they are portraying in an educational context. Personally, I am a socially awkward panda and I love doing first person interpretation, but I'm often very bad at staying in character. <laughs> especially if a member of the public asks me something that I know the answer to, but my character would. Okay, so now that we have covered the different types of historical costuming groups, let's look at some of the accommodations that I have made or seen over the years to keep myself and the people around me comfortable and healthy. I'm going to talk mostly about women's or female presenting clothing for this, specifically European clothing, just because that is my area of expertise, well, European and American. For the bulk of history through the Western world, women's clothing tends to be a lot more restrictive, and modern people think of the challenges involved in historical costuming. They're usually thinking about things like corsets. Not every era is created equally in terms of costuming, so it's important to consider that when looking at different groups. You might also find yourself dead set on a specific era, but feel that you can't manage it. There are a lot of ways to work around everything. So let's start with the obvious. Corsets, stays, and in general, these stiffened structural bodice pieces that gain popularity in the 1400s all the way up through World War I and the invention of the girdle. I could go off on a whole rant here about how corsets are not as bad as media makes them out to be, but that's another video. I will link to a blog post I did about that down below. I do encourage you to try the historically appropriate version of a costume before trying to find an alternative, just because especially with foundation garments, there is often a reason why they exist other than just the silhouette. Corsets and stays don't just shape the body, but they support the weight of the garments, which are often quite heavy and would sag or do strange things without them. They're also great for things like tucking ice packs down your bodice in the summer to stay cool and can help with some types of back pain. If it's an absolute no-go for you, don't worry. In most cases, you'll need to switch to a lower class persona, like a farmer, a merchant, or craftsperson who wouldn't be able to afford those heavy garments or have the skill involved for corsetry. Other alternatives include looking at Regency era England. Short stays were popular then, which can be approximated with a sports bra or other modern garment. Or um, looking at counterculture movements such as the aesthetic dress or rational dress movements of the 1870s to 1890s. I make sure that all of my costumes are lined. If we're talking about SCA era clothing, so the pre 1600s, then you're probably going to be looking at something from pre 1400, but there's a lot of variation here. Um, and I've seen a lot of people doing things like Viking or ancient Egyptian clothing in the heat of summer because it usually involves loose fitting linen garments. I make sure that all of my costumes are lined and I either fell down the seams or I use French seams to prevent fraying and stray threads. I use a nice muslin for the lining and for all the undergarments, I find the softest material possible, often old bed sheets that are either pieces from sets that we have purchased that, won't that we won't use, we never use our top sheets, or there's something that I've thrifted. The materials you pick should be of a natural fiber, if at all possible. This is going to make them more breathable on hot days, help, you keep, help keep you warmer on cold ones, and as a bonus, they're going to fit in better with whatever era that you choose. Sometimes you just can't find what you're looking for in a natural fiber that's within your budget, and that's okay. Make sure your garment is lined, preferably in linen or cotton. If you can piece the garment so that your polyester velvet bodice is broken up by some scraps of silk in the front, then that's going to make things more breathable and comfortable. When your skin can breathe, it doesn't sweat as much. When it does sweat, that moisture can evaporate quicker and it gets wicked away. So if you throw yourself into a poly rayon Guinevere costume from Party City, that moisture is just going to sit on your skin and make you feel hotter and then colder as the temperature drops in the evening. I like costumes or hairstyles that cover my ears when I'm at big events because that makes it easier to put in earplugs if I'm feeling overwhelmed by the noise. It makes it less obvious. Usually a hat, hood, or hairstyle takes enough of an edge off of the sound for me that I don't need them, but for big, unfamiliar places, I do like to carry earplugs with me just in case. 
The other key here is your basket or your kit, the stuff you bring with you that you aren't necessarily wearing. Most female presenting people and some male presenting people at these events carry a basket instead of a purse or bag, and a basket is super versatile. When I was at the museum, I used this basket. So it has a lid and I knit a cover for it because there's actually a logo on top that pegs it as not being from the Victorian era. The thing I love about that basket particularly is it has a flat bottom and a lid. I had a large, you saw I had a large handkerchief inside to help line it and keep things from falling out through the bottom. And I could keep my meds, my water, a snack, um, I've even been known to stick a drink in there with like a can cooler on it or something just to help keep it cold. Even just like a glass of ice that I can pick out when no one is looking. That's also where I keep my knitting, which for me is like a fidget spinner. It helps keep me calm when I'm anxious and gives me something to do. It helps tame my ADHD and my anxiety at the same time, so double win. The other great thing about historical costumes, especially pre-1800s, is giant tie-on pockets. No need to carry a bag, you can just stick everything in your pockets. <laughs> If you wear glasses, like me, most places aren't going to take them away from you or say that you can't wear them. If you want to be, if you want more historically accurate frames, however, check out sites like Zenny. Uh, this is not sponsored, but that's where I get all of my glasses from, and I've had a couple of frames in the past for living history that were suitable for the 1800s. They weren't spot on, but they were close enough. A simple round frame in silver or gold usually passes the glance test, i.e. I glance at you and don't immediately think that you're from 2024. Remember that we're just trying to suspend disbelief here. Also, no one is going to get mad at you if you need tinted lenses. Some tinted lenses did exist in the Victorian period, so if you need something to prevent migraines, don't worry about it, and you can add tinted lenses to historical looking frames if you are someone who can't function without sunglasses. In more casual groups like the SCA, even modern sunglasses are okay, though wearing them in costume at a reenactment might get some sidelong glances. Overall, the point I'm trying to make here is do what you need to to stay safe and stay healthy. And don't forget the sunblock. Really, don't. Don't forget the sunblock. The number one best piece of advice I can give you, other than making sure that your costume is well fitted and made of natural fibers, is to get good shoes. Usually, if they are solid black or brown and don't have zippers, no one's going to even notice them, um, even at stricter events. If you're not sure what the best option for your period is, feet often don't appear in portraits, go with simple black or brown ballet flats. If that's not an option for you, pick the most comfortable pair of shoes you have that you can stand or walk in if you're mobile. Usually there's a lot to see and do and no one wants wet feet or blisters. Ask the organizer about the terrain of the event, indoor, outdoor, on a hill, etc and make sure to check the weather in advance. If this means wearing bright yellow running shoes, then so be it. If you feel really self-conscious about it, you can always use your skirt to hide them when you sit down and make a note to order the same pair in multiple colors in the future. I have seen such a variety of footwear, believe me, no one cares most of the time. And if you're playing a lower class person, you can often get away with going barefoot, if it's safe to do so. If somebody's going to make a big deal about it, then they're probably not the right group for you to begin with. The best way you can accommodate for your sensory and health needs is by knowing the venue and the host. Your first foray into historical costuming might not be that comfortable, but hopefully knowing some of these tips can help make it easier on you. And the more that you're with a group, the more you'll learn specifically what helps you in each type of gathering. Disabled people have existed for as long as, as there have been people. While some conditions we have today might not have been recognized in the past, like autism or ADHD, or went by another name a hundred years ago, people with disabilities did exist, and it's important to show that, especially in living history and historical costuming spaces. 
Medical care today means that more disabled children live to adulthood. More adults are able to live comfortably and independently with minimal care and lack of funding for mental health treatment in this country means that we are no longer shuffled off to asylums or locked in attics at the first sign of defective behavior. Pros and cons. The main thing to remember at any of these events is that everyone wants you to have a good time. So if that means adapting your costume to be more accessible for your specific needs, like adding a zipper, then that's fine. Do what is necessary for you to be safe, comfortable, and healthy at an event. This might mean for your first event, you go with a more experienced member and just go in street clothes to get a feel for things. Also, please feel free to ask questions of anyone in GARP. We love talking about our costumes and our personas, so if you see something you think you can adapt or aren't sure about, just ask. And if you're too shy to ask a stranger at an event, you can ask me. I'll do what I can to help or at least clarify any rules or tips that I have that might help with current conditions. This community is full of neurodivergent weirdos and people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. In fact, I don't think I've met a single able-bodied neurotypical person in the entire time I've been in this community. Everyone has challenges and honestly, this is the group I have found the most willing to understand and help each other out. So I hope that helped you or at least gave you a little bit more confidence if you were thinking about joining a historical costuming group or at least testing the waters with one. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope that you have something cute and healthy to cuddle with. Ciao!